Welcome to uh, this edition of Drop In and Learn or Dial, as we like to call it. Uh, I'd like to thank you for uh, taking time to drop into the live webinar today, or if you're watching us on YouTube. If you are watching on YouTube and you want to participate in these webinars, we do hold them on a weekly basis, and you can learn more and sign up at dropinandlearn.org. My name is David Toddington, and uh, I'm going to be your host today, and along with a very special guest, actually a guy that I've been looking forward to meeting for years now, uh, Nico Deckens, who's joining us from the Netherlands and welcome to uh, the program, Nico, and great to have you here. Oh, thank you. It's my pleasure. It's an honor. Now, Nico, you've, um, you've got a, a really interesting background. I, I often joke that if you, if you don't know Nico, then you're probably not as connected to the OSINT world as, as you may think. Um, you've worked in, uh, in policing and military, um, and you've also worked for um, Bellingcat as well and done work for them. And I mean, they're really uh, preeminent when it comes to investigative journalism leveraging open source. Uh, maybe tell us just a little bit about the that sort of operational work and uh, and also the, the work that you've done at Bellingcat as well. Well, um, I've been uh, in law enforcement for over two decades where I um, helped design the open source intelligence field on its own. So um, courseware material, tooling, whatever, uh, for the Dutch law enforcement. And I teach a lot, a lot of, well, military personnel, as well as law enforcement personnel, how to conduct open source intelligence ethically, properly, and lawfully. And then I um, got at a moment in point in time where I knew the people from Bellingcat, or at least a handful of people, and we got talking and, um, well, I got a job there briefly for, for almost a year as a project manager where I helped set up their educational program for universities. So it was not about investigation. It's more, I was more in a uh, project manager role since I had the experience of managing projects. And after that, I um, stepped away again. And now I'm on my own, my own business. I'm doing a training for SANS, for instance, and Aware Online and my own company. So that's very brief, my history. And what is evident is this tremendous passion you have also for teaching uh, and sharing uh, these tools and techniques uh, as well. Yeah, yeah. In my opinion, um, I think open source intelligence, well, since the information is already open out there, why not openly share uh, techniques or uh, procedures? Not all of them, because some gems are so val valuable that you don't want to um, tell the bad guys to trick or the technique because it can be exploited for bad. So I just, in general, like to share information for us and for good. Right, exactly. It, it, it occurs to me that when, when you look at the global landscape as, uh, as far as OSINT goes, um, the Netherlands is just this little hotspot. When you, when you consider people like yourself, uh, Arno Reusser, um, the amount of, of training programs and expertise that comes out of the Netherlands seems uh, sort of much higher than, than elsewhere in the world. What would you attribute that to? Um, honestly, I, I really don't know. I've given this a lot of thought myself. Um, I like to think, well, I'm basically sure that our infrastructure internet-wise is pretty good and we are tech-savvy people over here in the Netherlands and we are open by nature. We like to talk to people we like to share. So I like to think that that's the main reason why uh, the Dutch are uh, quote unquote good at open source intelligence. <laughs> now, speaking of sharing, uh, you are one of the co-founders of uh, OSINT Curious. Maybe tell us just a little bit about that and how uh, people that are attending here today can actually uh, participate in that as well. Um, well, it was founded, uh, I think it's almost two years ago now, uh, we were on the DEXXL conference, which is a Dutch governmental law enforcement only um, cyber conference, which, which had a side track called Open Source Intelligence, where Micah Hoffman was invited, and I already knew him, and back then I was still in law enforcement. And Benjamin Strick from the BBC Africa and I was there, uh, Sector 035 uh, and Technic Setwater. And we were all basically, after a capture the flag moment, hanging out and having a beer. And we said, well, with all the knowledge in this room, we should, st we should start uh, a group. And Micah always, in his science classes, uh, talked about being ocean curious. So basically, he thought of the name. And that's how it was born. We are 
just a international group of like-minded people who like to share open source. We like to give back to the community because we learn from the community and we like to give back. And if people want to participate, um, there are forums on our website, osintcurio.us, and um, or you can just shoot any team member a DM or an email, and we are more than happy to help you for uh, maybe participate or something else. Right. Perfect. Well, thank you very much for, uh, for filling us in about that. And uh, we did have a comment, uh, comment here from Stefan uh, in, in saying, why is it that uh, there are so many OSINT people in the Netherlands? Um, he says, maybe bad weather, Dutch sitting at home with their computers. So <laughs> there you go. That's I, Stefan's opinion. Finally, <laughs> someone figured it out. Finally. <laughs> exactly. Now, what you're here to tell us about today, uh, Nico, is, is using Google and using it effectively. And this is one of the things that I personally feel very passionate about um, you know, I often say that Google is not a verb. You know, we talk about Googling someone. It is one of many search engines out there. And I think it's interesting, too, because most people, I guess this is the insidious thing about Google. It seems to be an easy to use thing, but most of us aren't very good at it. Most of us enter in two keywords on average, and about 97.5% of us go no further than the top 10 results that come back on that search engine results page. So um, with that, like you've got a, a short presentation here that we're lucky to, to uh, catch today. Maybe tell us a little bit about this and how we can be using Google better. Yeah, for sure. Um, should I share my screen? Is that the yeah, right sure. time now? Okay, cool. Yep. Um, oh, it says my, the host disabled screen sharing. So maybe you should. Oh, okay. Yeah, let's just uh, get back up here. Now, this might be one of those things where, okay, we've got to make you the host. There we are. Change your host. Yeah, we're all still learning as we transition over into the virtual world. Uh, try that now, Nico. You should be able to get it now. Yes. Uh, okay. Okay, share, uh, and you should be able to see my PowerPoint slide by now, right? We got it, that's uh, awesome. Okay, well, uh, we already discussed this, this is about me, so enough about, about me, let's skip this. If you wanna contact me, the fastest way is my Twitter handle, so that's underscore OSINT guy. Funny story to that, the underscore came because Twitter deleted my account because during the Turkish coup, I was open source intelligence information tweeting about it, and some, well, I think trolls, reported my account and I got blocked. So that's why the underscores between my name. But back to uh, the story. Um, Google, um, I think a lot of people do not know what happens when you do a Google search. So when you type something in the search bar, what happens in the background? What does Google and its servers do for you to get a result back? Or at least a result which is valuable for you. Uh, it's all about in my opinion, how Google indexes the web. And you need to understand how um, the background, the inner working of Google works to understand how to formu formulate or think about uh, the searches you can do or search queries you can perform. Um, because Google uses crawlers, um, also some people like to call them spiders, and they basically uh, walk kind of through uh, websites and they index the text of such a page. Um, when they are doing that, they immediately check whether there are links mentioned on the websites and they try to follow those links and then index the text from those sites again. Um, what they do, they, when they index, they try and grab the unique words from that index and add a certain value based on currentness and popularity. So. Uh, the more people type in a certain word, the higher value that unique word comes from, for instance, Toddington.com. Um, so the indexing follows protocols. Um, for example, when a website administrator or owner um, has a certain text file, which is called robots.txt, he can tell uh, a crawler, and it's not, doesn't have specifically have to be Google, what they can or cannot index, what they allow to be indexed. So um, this is immediately really important because now you already know that Google isn't represented for the entire internet or the web. Um, the last numbers uh, that I've heard from people within Google, that they only index about 8% of the entire clear visible internet. So you're bound to miss more than 90% anyway when you're only, um, looking into Google. Um, so they 
follow those links. Um, they uh, throw away broken links because they're not valuable. They're making keywords and they're adding value to them. And they are also looking for um, when they um, crawl a website for the second time or the third time or the hundredth time, they are looking for new content on that website. So the more um, content that's fresh, new, they call it page freshness, the higher value your website gets in the ranking system. So that's all something to keep in mind when you are trying to find information. Um, and now more importantly uh, for me, there are also things that Google doesn't index. And that's really important because sometimes people still uh, have uh, the idea that um, you can find Facebook information or Instagram information from accounts or timelines within Google. That's partially true because there are pages and community pages which are openly indexed. But a normal user timeline from, for instance, a Facebook page or TikTok won't be indexed by uh, Google. Why? Because Google uh, kind of knocks on doors first. And if you have a door policy, and I would like to say a you like the bouncer and the bouncer says, no, Google, you can't enter and you can't see what's behind this username and password, this timeline. So you can't index it. Same counts for forums or employee portals. Those are all portals which you need to log into. And Google just can't and hasn't got the credentials to log in and to look for that information, index the text from it and provide it back from you in a search. So it's just nearly impossible. Same counts for industrial servers or, and that's a bigger problem, which I expect in the near future will change uh, mobile platforms, mobile apps and games, because, um, well, hardly anyone uses a laptop uh, unless you're an OSINT practitioner or uh, some kind of forensic people, but people use mobile devices and all those apps and what happens on those platforms isn't indexed by Google either. Um, and again, like those sitemap rules, um, yeah, they just um, don't index those, pieces, uh, those pieces of information. So once you know that these pieces of information uh, cannot be found, you need to go manually in those sources themselves. So go to the source. That would be my number one go-to. Do not rely on Google because it's just crawling, it's scratching the surface of websites and indexes. Um, also good to, uh, to know is um, they sort your results and they do it using a technique they call the knowledge graph. And that's a dynamic and graphical algorithm that's uh, kind of um, sorts your results based on your settings. So it could be either your uh, user settings uh, from your Chrome browser, it could be your location coming from your IP address or from your browser, it could be um, ranking based on your interest, so your previous searches, what have you searched within Google while being logged in into your Google account. Um, keyword matching, so uh, if you have searched a certain keywords like five times and one keyword uh, one time, it gives more priority to that keyword. Uh, but also again, how new is the content that you're looking for? So newer content always gets ranked higher than older content from a website. Um, but also the relevance and usability of a web page. So for instance, if you are looking into this, uh, I don't know, uh, financial crime or cyber crime, and these uh, crooks have a website that's 10 years old and has never been updated and rarely has new content, it's not likely to end up on page one of the Google search results. It's more likely to end up on page six, seven, or 10, or even further. So. These are all things to keep in mind when you are typing in keywords. Think of these things. Um, but more importantly, this is something that Google posts on its own site. They tell it themselves, we sell advertising, not search results. So keep those things in mind. They're not there to give you the right answer. You need to formulate your search query as targeted as possible to get, um, let's say, you create a haystack with as low of possible volume and then high relevance. That's what you're trying to create. Uh, back to the knowledge graph. Uh, when you look at a knowledge graph, this is an example how the knowledge graph tries to interpret um, words. 
for instance, here you see the word chains, and it has three different ways how humans can interpret the word change. Uh, a computer has a very difficult time on understanding, uh, let's say, sarcasm, proverbs. It's just nearly impossible, and it will get better in the future, but I doubt it will be ever as good as we humans can interpret those things. So it's really hard for them, uh, Google, to give you a right answer based on a phrase or a sentence. Another yeah, example. I think it's a really important point here, Nico. And one of the things that's important to maybe consider is that the way our brain works is far more complex than, than even the advanced artificial intelligence algorithms that Google is using. And would you suggest it's important to perhaps, rather than expect the search engine to think like you do, you need to think like the search engine does? Absolutely. You, you, I, honestly, computers are dumb. If you don't tell them exactly what to do, they won't do it. So here again, if you're looking for how to change a light bulb and you do, you only type, uh, type in change light, change light, then it's, it would, you get answers that may not be what you're looking for. But when you phrase it in context with a light bulb, the knowledge graph might be able to interpret. For instance, if someone writes a message with on her on their blog or whatever, like saying uh, he has a really fat whip with thick rims underneath, we all probably know that we are talking about uh, expensive car with uh, nice rims on it. It doesn't necessarily mean that if we uh, type those keywords within Google, that they are able to understand that a whip and thick rims are about an expensive car with uh, nice wheels underneath it. So think about how either people would name stuff online or how computers interpret text. This is really important for you to get the right answer. Um, this is something, these, fre these freshness algorithms um, are presenting your results based on trending keywords or topics. Well, for instance, there are riots going on over, all over the world due to COVID and other and Black Lives Matter. So it's most likely that results based on those trending topics end up higher than um, other keywords, which might not even, even be related to what you're looking for, just because they th Google thinks this is trending now, so probably you're looking for this. So they're trying to think for you. And so you have to formulate your phrase really specific to get a right answer back. Um, but also, um, if you look at the examples, when you type in uh, Google Lakers scores, they will understand that you're looking for scores from the Lakers, the, the basketball um, group, uh, sports group. And they will also know based on freshness that you're probably looking for the most recent scores so it will give you the most recent because because it wouldn't make sense if you only type in Lakers scores to give you the results from 10 ways back because most people would be interested to on the most recent scores same goes for the weather in amsterdam if you type that in you would get the current weather in amsterdam or the forecast not the weather from two years ago so again google is trying to think for you as a user and as an osmond investigator you don't want search engines to think for you. You want to think for them. Uh, the route to Paris, that's something that's uh, a stable source, as I would like to call it. Uh, from my city in Amsterdam to Paris, there's only one route to Paris, well, one straight way. So Google would give me that. That's uh, a stable source, for instance. So th those are also things to keep in mind. And then lastly, there's something called PageRank, which is named after one of the founders from Google, Larry Page. Um, and what it does, it uh, tries to organize website based on importance. So for instance, if you have a major news outlet like CNN, you'll have a lot of other news outlets or forums or blogs linking towards their articles, which makes them technically seen from Google's perspective more popular. So they will rank them higher up than that obscure website that you may be looking for because no one links to watch that website. So that's something you need, really need to uh, keep in mind when you are looking for that niche piece of information. 
how likely is it that people will uh, link towards that really niche piece of information. So how likely would it be that it, it will end up in your results uh, on page one or two or whatever. So that's the running gag within the OSINT community. You can hide a dead body on page 10 of Google because no one looks there. Um, so once you know that these things and you keep them in the back of your mind, you can start using search operators and or Boolean search operators as some people like to call them. And here are the most common ones you can use. Um, the AND basically isn't there because the AND is just a space. So if you uh, were searching for my name, Nico Dakins, and you do a space in between, basically you're asking Google, go into your library, look in all the cabinets, look for the word Nico, and if you found the word Nico, look in all those doc documents, and if they're somewhere on this page, the word Dakins, then I want you to give, Mac, give me back those results. Uh, same counts for the OR, it's just not AND, it's just Nico or Dakins, and it will give you either one of those, or both. So that's really important. So if you're looking for something spe specific, which most of um, common human names have, have a first name and a last name, you would have to put it in between adjacencies, because then you're telling Google, I'm looking for this combination of words in this order, in this way. So you would have to type adjac adjacency open, Nico space Dakins adjacency close hit enter and then it will look for in that index that library for all documents where my name or people named Nico Dakins uh, are placed and then give you back results only where these uh, two names are in that particular order. Let's say you find results which are useless for you. Let's say you've been done adjacency Nico Dakins and you wanna leave something out, for instance, the word Amsterdam, because it creates noise in your search results. You do a dash Amsterdam, and then it will rule out everything which has the word Amsterdam within the documents with where, where you're looking for. And something that people really uh, forget is file type and extension. Basically, those things do the same thing. Um, we all know that Everything within Microsoft Office uh, has extensions, Doc, DocX, XLS, XLSX, PowerPoint has PPT or PPTX. You can search on those extensions. So for instance, if I, if I was to look for all PDF documents on Toddington.com, you want me to show me just briefly? Sure, yeah, absolutely. Uh, let me quickly switch screens. New. Share and I think so. So what it, what you're saying here, Nico, and I think this is a really important point is it's it's a process of of tightening up your query and and making it very concise. But then sometimes we need to kind of loosen it off just a little bit as well. Uh, yeah. So the idea of using the the quote marks, as we say, around somebody's name, uh, one of the things I find is a really kind of a cool trick too is you've got the quote, the first name. Uh, the space, the second name, the surname, and then the end quote, is to put an, even an asterisk in the middle as well, because what that does is it kind of broadens out that pattern of words. So you have now got uh, the first name up to five wildcard keywords, and then the last name, and you might get a middle name in amongst that as well, exactly. which, yeah. which, is, which is really important to do. Yeah, and my advice would be exactly like that. Uh, begin broad and narrow it down step by step. So and always keep track of uh, each step you've taken because sometimes you want to revert back because uh, the next step you've got too much noise or not what you're looking for. So um, here I want to give you an example for, let's say if there are um, documents with the keyword OSINT uh, within, uh, with a file type uh, PDF coming from the domain Huntington.com. So basically what I'm asking Google, do I, did I make a typo? No, uh, because typos is where you screw up nine of the times when you're doing a Google Earth. Um, basically I'm asking Google, go into your library, look for the keyword open source and tell OSINT. Once you've found the keyword OSINT, then throw everything away that isn't a PDF. Uh, and once you have uh, sorted those, then throw everything away that isn't coming from Toddington.com. 
and only those results are the results I want to see. So once I hit enter, you will see I will only have 82 results coming from Toddington.com, having the keyword OSINT in it, being a PDF. So this is the way you target a search from a specific site, for instance. If I was only to look for PDFs with the keyword OSINT in it, I could lose to Toddington.com and do the same thing. And then I'll have over 44,000 results with PDFs. I can do a similar thing for uh, Word documents, looking for doc or maybe docx, the newer version, the XML version of doc. So quickly in this way, you can try and get information from Google, which you create your own haystack because when we go back two steps, uh, I think 82 results are, is an amount that's digestible for you as a researcher. 44,000 results would take you either days and months or you'd have to form a team of 51 people performing, looking at the documents for ages. So it's all about really trying to uh, think of what you're looking for and then try and formulate a search query which is as targeted as possible. For instance, let's say we've got 82 documents now, but I don't want to have the documents which has the keyword project management in it or management. I could now do a dash saying exclude everything after, after this word and let's say manage, management. Oh. I think I made a typo. Yeah. And now, and this is weird. Now I've got 92 results. Isn't that weird? I got 82 yeah. results doing. Uh, without management, and I made a typo. Let's do something else because this is a bad example. But it's Let's... always interesting, isn't it? I mean, the 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 weird little things, the quirks about this. You, you, this has happened many times to myself. You expect that by excluding a word, that you're going to be reducing the number of results, yeah. and yet somehow it it increases. So tell me also now. Um, you alluded earlier on to to this idea of filter bubbling uh, your previous queries and how that's going to impact your your current queries um, also location is, is quite important here as well i mean you are uh, in the netherlands right now you're using a dutch ip address you're you're ending up on google netherlands is there going to be significantly different results that if i'm doing that same search here in canada using a canadian ip address will the results be different Absolutely. Um, funny story is even if within the same building from coming from the same IP address two devices, let's say I've got two Windows laptops li lined up and we do at the same time enter for the exact, exact same search and our settings are exact the same, we will get different results or at least in amount, in the amount of results or the way they are sorted. So it's all based on your machine fingerprint and prior searches. And, and maybe a, uh, some, something that an investigator may even want to consider is if uh, if you are in, um, let's say, Germany, for example, and you're searching for somebody in uh, Mexico, uh, you might even want to consider going into the settings and setting Google for the Mexican version of Google and then conduct your search and it might help you out just that little bit extra. Absolutely. I've, I've got um, a numerous examples where I, uh, when I changed to either doing a Google switching from Google.com to, for instance, Google.de, which is the German version or Google.fr for the French version, I got better results because I was looking something country specific or person specific, which was coming from the country. So either coming from that search index or uh, language base really matters on the amount of results. So that's, yeah, I can totally agree on that. So basically that's what I got to share about this. And if you want to know a little bit more, some shameless self promotion about this one, I've got uh, a training coming up a full day on uh, the bit.ly Google July 9th. It's together with Wear Online. So it's a full day, uh, you can hear me talk about open source intelligence related to Google advanced searching and also monitoring. So that's basically what I got to share. And if you want to talk a little bit more, I'm here. Yeah.
Yeah, absolutely. Um, and highly recommended uh, to, to spend a day with Nico as well. I would, uh, I would actually recommend um, definitely going in the, and checking that out. Um, if you do have questions, uh, for those of you in the audience today, uh, please just feel free to use the, uh, the question and answer uh, feature at the bottom of your screen, and we'll be certainly happy to pass those on to Nico right now. So we'll spend another, I don't know, 10 minutes or so, Nico, if I can take a little bit of yeah, your valuable sure. time uh, some more. Uh, so maybe you could actually just uh, perhaps fire up your screen and just sort of uh, show us a couple of these things sort of uh, live. I mean, I know you've, you've done that a little bit before, but um, maybe uh, sort of uh, expand on this um, as to, again, this idea that somewhere out there is the document that you're looking for how is it uh, that you get to that? So, for example, um, if we wanted to look at a specific date, how would how could we go about doing that um, using this tool? Um, well, I would also like to point out now because people for forget there are buttons here. Are um, searching Google? They're nine out of ten times nowadays doing it from a mobile device. And on a mobile device, these buttons just aren't visible. So, let's say we are looking for uh, the keyword. Um, OSINT again, just keeping it really basic. And I want to narrow it down to a specific date range looking for within the index of Google. I can click on tools and I there will pop up a context menu and it will say, and would you just want results from any time we indexed it? Or do you want to have it from the past hour, the past 24 hours, the past week, the past month, the past year? Or do you want a custom date range? So we could change it from, for instance, let's say last, uh, what is it, May uh, 31 to uh, the 2nd of June. And now I'll only search the keyword within the index of Google uh, in this day range, keeping in mind that it could generate results from two weeks ago or a month ago or a year ago. It is it will only give you back results which ended up within the index within this date range. So here you'll have the results coming from this date range hitting the keyword uh, open source intelligence. So that's a really basic way of doing it. Of course, you can always do uh, Google dorking by doing date ranges by looking at Google advanced searches. But I think for now, this might be a little bit too complex to do all the dorkings. So right. this is probably the easiest and quickest way, quick and dirty way to do it, especially when it comes to breaking news and you want to see if something um, really pops up. Let's say there's a, a fight somewhere going out, fight in um, New York. There would probably be some fighting in New York. And let's narrow it down to the past hour. Yeah. And it will give you only results which are indexed by Google hitting these three keywords. So basically say, look for fight and New York and, and new and York. Maybe you want to make it. Yes, sorry. Th th this is interesting as well, because sometimes we want to kind of turn that around. Um, let's say that we were to uh, take the name of someone who is very quickly rose to prominence. So now when you search their name, you get uh, all the stories related to an incident that has occurred within the past few days. Now you want to do some research and find out who this person was before uh, they suddenly became so notorious or so well known. Uh, you can sort of go back in time as well and, and select date range prior to a specific incident. Um, yeah. So that, that could be quite useful. We've got a few questions here, Nico. Uh, Stefan asks, uh, how about other search engines like Bing and Yandex? And when do you prefer these alternatives? Um, my golden rule is exhaust your resources. So there is no uh, number one search engine, in my opinion. There are a top three, which are, in my opinion, still Google, Bing, and Yandex. Uh, DuckDuckGo is really growing. But um, honestly, I would try at least the largest four, including DuckDuckGo, for every search I conduct, just to make sure. I've got uh, one story which I always like to tell I was doing counterterrorism within the law enforcement. I was looking for something uh, terrorist related. I did a search within Google, no results. I did a search within Bing, no results. I did a, a search within Yandex, no results. And I did it in DuckDuckGo and I found what I was looking for and I got even more. So it's really important for you to do the exact same search, the exact same keywords in different search engines. 
So again, as we said earlier on, um, and the point you made is don't get stuck in just using Google, using Google as a verb. Um, think about other search engines. Uh, perhaps the, the, the best search engine you never heard of uh, could be the one that actually ends up producing the result. And I think that's a, a really good example right there. Uh, yeah. Bill asks, uh, how do we turn queries into active Google alerts? So things that we're searching on an ongoing basis, is there, is there some way that we can have Google alert us when a certain term comes up? Yes, you can. There is something that's called Google alerts. There's one a little operation security risk in there. You need to have a Google account and log in, and then you can set a Google alert, uh, which can either uh, give you uh, a ping in your email saying, well, these keywords were hit. Do you want to click on the URL and look for the search results? Or you can set up an RSS feed and put it in your RSS reader. So that's, that can be done, but that's all in my workshop. Uh, I teach you those things. Perfect. Um, Andrew asks, uh, will the language used, uh, and the example that Andrew gives is French, Italian, et cetera, also influence the results rather than English all the time? So considering asking your query in another language. Yeah, absolutely. That's really important because, um, well, keep in mind when you're looking for, let's say, an Italian uh, arms dealer, which is selling his goods online and he doesn't even know English. So he probably will advertise his goods in Italian. So it would be really valuable for you to to use those Italian words either by using a thing called Google Translate or having a professional translator translating the sentence for you. So, yeah, that's a really good point and really valuable to try. Perfect. We do have uh, time for a couple more questions as well. So if you do have a question for Nico, please feel free to use the question and answer feature at the bottom of your screen and, uh, and submit those. And uh, we have uh, one more. Uh, is there a difference in the order of keywords? So in the example you've just given here, they say uh, fight New York uh, as opposed to New York fight. Uh, will there be a difference in the results that come back? Um, in essence, there shouldn't be. Uh, but sometimes Google just works in mysterious ways. So I tried juggling around with these things. Um, for this specific question, fight New York or New York fight, um, we can try. The screen is open. So I've got fight New York here. Now let's flip it around and do New York fight. And let's see um, the difference. Let me first do any time. So just to see, we got uh, 1.27... Uh, a lot of results. Let's see if we can change that amount to something else. And then you'll have your answer. Yes, it matters. So all these things. Um, and again, how would, for instance, uh, a news outlet phrase their headline on a newspaper? Would they say there was a fight in New York or New York, huge fight? It's, exactly. it's all about the way people name it. And interestingly, when you look at the, uh, the not just the different number of results, but the Eventbrite uh, that we saw come up here is the number one result. Now, the second query did come up with uh, videos, but it, it came back to that search, uh, that same top result. Uh, so Eventbrite uh, promoting fight events in New York City, but then very different immediately below that. So, so a very different group of results. Uh, John asks about the use of Boolean operators now, um, and then says, how useful do you find the, the around operator in Google searches? Uh, the around operator, I, um, I most of the time like to use that one uh, when I'm looking for sentences. So for instance, I'm looking for uh, a witness stating, uh, the car went in that direction, but I don't know in what order they used uh, those words. I would do car around five, perhaps, and then uh, way. Then you could try, let me see if I can come up with a quick search just to m make it make sense. Let do, let's do uh, fight around five. So I'm telling you, I'm telling, um, the system look for the word fight and New York and I'll do New York New York exact because I want to make sure it's looking for New York in this particular order so basically I'm asking Google look for the word fight and around five means either five words before or five words afterwards the word fight 
the word New York must appear. So there has to be five words in between. Let me see what happens. And here it will say New York. There's a file exchange, New York. Let me see the other way around. So basically what it's doing, and, it's, and that's where Google gets tricky because sometimes you get results and you'll say, well, hey, I typed in fight and New York, but for instance, I won't see the word fight here, but I will see it here. Sometimes the results will be on the page itself. So you need to click on the URL and confirm on the page itself if those words are interconnected. So, and I, and I think you've also answered a, another question that's popped up here in the example New York fight. Is Google assuming that you want the word and in between new and the word York and then fight, or is it using and or? Um, and I think you kind of, you've answered that to a certain degree. And I think what you've done there is really important as well to put those quote marks around New York. Um, you're, you're telling Google you want those two words in that order. Is, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. I want I want them specifically in that order because uh, cities, names, brands, um, those are always spelled in a particular order. So if you put in between quotes adjacency, that really helps to narrow and target it down. Right. So the structure of of the query as you've got it here is really important, and I I think also you you've uh, touched on something else that's important. Um, the algorithm that, that Google is using, and the many algorithms actually that Google is using, there's a change of at least two a day, every single yeah. day, if not much more than that. And um, one of the things I find interesting is um, what works today probably or may not work tomorrow. The, the changes occur that rapidly. And, and I think as you've rightly pointed out as well, um, sometimes there seems to be no, no rhyme, no reason. Um, you, you think you're reducing the number of queries and then you get more results that end up coming back uh, no matter what you end up doing. Yeah, Google works in mysterious ways. The, the talks I've had with people working at Google is that they, um, their core developers say, we honestly don't always know how it the inner works within Google work. So it's, yeah. it's changing. Now there's a, another question here, which, um, which I think could go in a whole pile of different ways that they ask very simply, how about links between persons? Uh, so when you're trying to generate links between persons and um, I, I guess to the way I would see that is, is really, again, what you're doing with Google, it's you're just looking for a document, you're entering in keywords and you're looking for a document, as you said earlier on, that contains those keywords. So when it comes to links between persons, this requires some real outside the box thinking, but maybe tell us a little bit about that, how you would, uh, how you would find links between individual people. Talking about uh, documents, let's say a marriage document or uh, someone bought a house. Uh, what makes a document like that unique? Um, it would have signatures on it. Uh, so I would look for uh, those names. Let's say, I don't know, let's pick uh, John Doe because John Doe lives on the internet. Um, let's do John Doe. And we would do uh, a document search because we are looking for a document where maybe he or his wife or his spouse is also named in. So that would be Jane Doe. Hoping that this one works. This is, I'm making this one up right now. And I'm looking for uh, files, file types, uh, only PDFs, because I'm assuming that documents which are signed are being scanned and being made into uh, PDFs or at least uh, non editable uh, ish. So looking for PDFs. And it has to have a keyword called signature because you have to sign a document. I think you got a typo and file type there too, Nico. Oh yeah, correct. Yeah. I'll correct that. Yeah. And so what's really important here is that you are, uh, so your, your process prior to answering the query, because there's no one way of getting this information. And I often think that the news on the fact that if this was a really easy thing to do, if there was always one way of doing it, we wouldn't have what work because a machine could simply replicate this process over and over. It's a matter of that creative thinking of asking yourself the question, where might this information be? What can I do to find a way of linking these two people? So now you're looking for a document uh, that could be a legal document that contains these two names. And regardless of what shows up in your results right now, uh, the concept is a really important here. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's, 
it's more of, it's conceptual thinking and that's what it always is especially nowadays uh for instance when you're looking for phone numbers the shifting with uh, the use of emoticons for instance uh, people used to have on their contact page a uh, phone or phone number nowadays they shift that towards an, an emoticon of uh, a phone or a mobile phone so yeah. you could even in essence do a search based on an emoticon in combination with the name of the person you're looking for. So and that, and that's a really good example, because when you think about that, uh, we're, we're the, the question was specific to linking between persons, but what about finding a link between a phone number and an individual or an email address and an individual as well? Um, yeah. By entering in a phone number just into Google, may you find a document that has call, you know, Nico Deccans at, and then it's got that phone number. So now we know that that phone number that we've entered in may be associated to, uh, to Nico Deccans. That, that yeah. occurred to me that it's the same thing. I find a lot of phone numbers in people's resumes because people like to share their resumes online because they want to be found and hired. And they put everything in there because they want to get contacted. Right. Perfect. We are uh, out of time now, Nico. Uh, and also, we don't want to be, uh, you know, there's so much more to this. And, and again, if you just want to quickly tell us, you've got the, the course coming up in July. Uh, it's going to be a full day uh, where there's going to be delving into this in much greater detail. So maybe just give us that date quickly again. It's the uh, July 9th and more information can be found either on my Twitter timeline or uh, via aware-online.com and look for workshop. Perfect. All right. Nico Deckens, it's, it's been a real pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much for taking time out. Uh, great to finally meet you after, after all yeah, these likewise. years. And I, and I, I really strongly recommend uh, having a look at, uh, at Nico's course, which will be coming up soon. You'll be picking up all kinds of useful stuff. Um, I always, you know, sort of, again, consider that if you, um, there is a return on investment here. If, if it means you're finding better information, and, and you're doing it in less time, then that is uh, a significant benefit. Uh, you're going to be that much more efficient uh, in the workplace. Okay, thank you very much. Better. Of, absolutely, and thanks very much for all of you for showing up today. Uh, we are going to be talking next week uh, about uh, epidemiology and specific COVID. Um, we're going to be having microbiologist uh, Chelsea Goodman, who's going to be coming in. Uh, Chelsea is a, uh, a former um, uh, if, if, Chief uh, of uh, Events at the Public Health uh, Canada Laboratory, Microbiology Laboratory, and uh, actually was involved in standing up responses to Ebola, swine flu, and also SARS as well. So the investigative process of putting together pieces of data uh, as a, an outbreak occurs, and then the, uh, the response that is geared towards that, it'll be a very interesting uh, discussion for her to talk about uh, COVID and, and these past events as well and how we are uh, ultimately dealing with it. So thanks very much, Nico, and uh, thanks yeah, for attending. My pleasure. We'll see you next week. Okay.